I welcome everyone to the kickoff of the core facility seminar series featuring computational modeling. For those of you who do not know me, I am Lisa Korpieski, the Director of Communications and Marketing at the Institute for Applied Life Sciences. In today's seminar, you will be hearing from Dr. Chung Wang Liang, the Director of Computational Modeling, as well as our guest speaker, Professor Michael Fayer from the Chemistry Department at Stanford University. We are hoping that with these biweekly seminars, you will discover what great resources that the centralized UMass core facilities offer to our campus community and the New England region. And just a few housekeeping items for today for the seminar. The seminar is being recorded. I recommend you set your view mode to speaker. Please stay muted during the talks and put all of your questions into the chat and they will be read at the end of the presentations. Thank you. Next, I would like to introduce you to Andrew Bernard, director of our UMass Amherst core facilities. Andrew. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, a special thank you to Lisa for coordinating this on fairly short notice, to Isabel for all of your support, uh, to Chung Wen for being the first core featured, and to Professor Fair for sharing your work with us today. Uh, as Lisa mentioned, my name is Andrew Bernard, and I'm the director of the Centralized UMass Core Facilities here. Uh, I'm very excited about this, and I hope this will be the first of many core seminars to both educate our research community about the re robust resources available, and for you to hear from partners and experts who appreciate the importance of these invaluable resources. As a reminder about our cores, uh, they are open to anyone from undergrads on the UMass campus to senior scientists, regardless of affiliation, uh, including outside researchers and commercial partners. Uh, many of our cores even offer training so that you become a user, though under the current conditions uh, with the pandemic, that, that's a little bit challenging uh, in some of the cores. Uh, there are many opportunities to fund your work in the cores if you haven't worked them, with them yet. Uh, for UMass users specifically and IL faculty members, there are core credits that you can use to access the cores at any given time. Uh, and there's additional several C funding programs that you might have access to to be able to get funding to use these courses if you haven't before. Uh, for those who may be on the call as external partners or for those who work with folks out in the industry, uh, the Mass Innovation Voucher Program is available to subsidize usage for small companies based in Massachusetts up to 75%. So a lot of opportunity to figure out how you can come work with us. Most importantly, we as the UMass Core Facilities are here to be your partner and to help grow research capabilities for both you and UMass. Please feel free to reach out to me or any of the core facilities directly if you have questions or would like more information. Last but not least, as this is our first seminar, we are looking for folks to share topics of, of things they'd like us to discuss. And if you have anything you think would be really great for the course to highlight or talk about, please feel free to reach out. We want this to be an inclusive and, and engaging seminar series moving forward. Uh, I'll be here and available in the Q&A if there are any questions for me or broadly. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Chung Wen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me share my screen. So everybody can see my screen, right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, thanks for uh, Andrew uh, for the introduction. Um, so welcome to our uh, first online seminar. So this is uh, Chong Wen Liao, uh, Computational Modeling Core Facility. Um, so today in the, uh, the first seminar, I'd like to give you an overview about um, the core facility at UMass and especially uh, focus on uh, computational modeling and like uh, what is our expertise and uh, what kind of a service we can provide to a user and uh, collaborators. Um, so as you might know, and also mentioned by Andrew, so uh, so far there are 32 uh, core facilities uh, under IELTS, uh, Institute for Applied Life, Science, Life, Life Sciences, and they are actually operated by professional directors. Um, so we not only provide um, state-of-the-art equipment like uh, mass uh, spectrometry, NMR, uh, light microscopy, and uh, material design and fabrication, but also offer professional consulting service to help our uh, users uh, or collaborators to design, uh, to investigate, to analyze, and validate their research question and research projects. And currently, our users are mainly uh, faculty members in UMass, um, as well as students and also some external uh, collaborators, so whether from uh, academic lab, research lab, or industrial partners. And um, so the first goal of uh, computational modeling core facility is to help uh, our users to study uh, complex uh, molecular system using uh, computer simulation and uh, modeling approaches. Yeah, I would say, um, Molecular modeling and simulation quite often complement to uh, many um, ex uh, experimental techniques like uh, NMR, a mass spec, or uh, optical spectroscopy. Because um, modeling and simulation are able to provide uh, we call 
um, atomistic resolution in the length scale, and also also the ultra fast uh, time resolution from range from femtosecond, picosecond to nanosecond, and those information actually are generally missing in those kind, kind of experimental technique I mentioned before. And the second goal is to help users to uh, analyze uh, complex um, data set. So using computer algorithm like a machine learning framework. So nowadays really popular. So um, as we know very often that uh, the correlation between uh, the important input factors and uh, the outcome of the result are highly entangled. So in those kind of a big data set. So um, using for example, machine learning uh, framework. So one can uh, very easily to uh, deduce such kind of um, complex correlation. So uh, as a computational modeling core facility, so we provide several uh, different kind of services. So focusing more on uh, the intellectual input. So such as um, uh, designing and performing uh, molecular modeling um, and simulation. And also we provide high performance computing services. So like um, usage of the CPU or uh, GPU clusters and also uh, data analysis and interpretation, and as well as uh, training on uh, specific modeling or uh, simulation software packages. So uh, the general procedure for us to involve in the project, so it's like this. So when a collaborator or a user approach to us, and we will evaluate first uh, the research question and decide the best uh, strategy for them, so we will perform um, molecular modeling or simulation and as well as, as analyze the data, the, the outcome of the simulation and modeling. And we, we will also help user to interpret the data. So I would say that's a very important part that because, because quite often, even we have um, the data or the result from simulation. So we don't know how to interpret. So we, we will help user to interpret their data and also propose, propose uh, hypotheses or solution to their project. And we're also helping faculties or uh, startup companies for writing grant proposals or preparing uh, scientific manuscripts. So uh, since um, 2018, so we help users to publish already five papers and support like three grant applications. So here I'd like to uh, just uh, briefly introduce uh, my background. So I received my PhD in uh, University of Groningen in Netherlands. And after that, I spent a few years in Switzerland for my uh, postdoc research. And my expertise is molecular modeling, uh, for example, like um, a molecular dynamic simulation, uh, quantum chemistry calculation, uh, molecular docking, screening, and small molecule design. So here I'd like to uh, demonstrate two uh, success stories. So the first one is a mechanism of small molecule drugs. So actually the project was initiated by a startup company registered in Massachusetts. Um, so they would like to develop small molecule drugs for targeting Alzheimer's disease. And in their early papers, so in their vitro experiment, so they found actually two drug candidates can potentially inhibit um, the aggregation of amylo beta peptide. And uh, we would say, which is uh, uh, the key factors for promoting uh, Alzheimer's disease. But the detailed mechanism, how uh, the drug interacts with the peptide is not very clear. So uh, we help them to perform molecular dynamic simulation to study uh, the interaction between the peptide and the small molecule drugs. And we found that actually there's a, uh, we call non-specific binding mechanism, uh, which is very, very different from uh, the traditional view that uh, the drug binding on the protein should be on a specific site or specific location. And the interaction between uh, the drug and the, the pep peptide or protein should be strong and long lived but here we found that uh, the small molecule interact with uh, um, the intrinsic, intrinsically disordered protein like uh, amylo beta peptide. So the, the binding site is, is not specific, it means like the drug can bind everywhere along uh, the peptide surface. And also the interaction between drug and peptide is transient and weak, so which is very different from uh, the traditional, traditional view. Yes. And the second story uh, is a collaboration with uh, one of the UMass faculty in chemistry department. So they study uh, copper-induced protein aggregation and self-assembly. So here I show you the, uh, um, the beta-2 microglobin actually uh, is kind of a um, um, soluble protein and play a very important role in um, dialysis-related amyloidosis. And uh, it is found that 
actually copper can copper ion can can promote such kind of aggregation and self assembling process. But again, the detailed mechanism, especially at the atomic uh, atomistic level, so it's still poorly understood. So um, we we perform quantum chemistry uh, calculation, molecular dynamics, and protein-protein docking, uh, all kinds of uh, modeling and simulation algorithm to uh, help the uh, help them to build up different oligomer state model as showing on the screen. So from dimer, tetramer to polymer. And then, um, so we propose kind of self-assembly pathway of the uh, beta two microglobin. And it turns out that our hypothesis actually in a very good agreement with the experimental data uh, using the uh, mass, uh, spectrometry, and all the promising results actually end up with a, a publication in uh, JMB, a Journal of Molecular Bio Biology last year. Yeah. Okay, so uh, my introduction of the core uh, uh, computational modeling core facility is pretty much like this. So you can find my uh, email, my uh, phone number address on our website. So showing here, uh, www.umass.edu slash IELTS slash computational modeling. So now I'd like to uh, introduce um, uh, our invited speaker today, Professor uh, Michael Fayer. Um, Mike actually uh, received his PhD in uh, UC Berkeley in uh, 1974. And he joined uh, Stanford University as a faculty member directly after his PhD. And uh, he's a um, uh, pioneer in the field of nonlinear optical spectroscopy since uh, 70s. And uh, I just checked uh, his website. So he published around uh, 500 research paper. Please correct me if, if I say something wrong, yeah. And two textbooks about uh, quantum mechanics. Yeah, and his research interest, interest focus on uh, study the structural dynamics of uh, complex uh, molecular system, including uh, proteins, uh, membranes, um, ionic liquids, uh, water ion interaction, and as well as uh, polymers, yeah. So I believe um, today he will be talking about uh, the polymer project that collaborate with uh, computational modeling core facility. Uh, let's welcome uh, Professor Michael Fair. Okay, uh, listen, it's a pleasure uh, to join you and uh, I'm going to sh hopefully share my screen now. Yes. Okay, good, it worked. Okay, so um, I'm going to start by just showing you a little bit of what we do, at, although uh, Chang Wan uh, just uh, summarized it. But what we are is we're a group that for a long time now, uh, longer maybe than I can even remember, we've been developing and applying complicated optical methods, which are, as it says here, akin to multi-dimensional NMR, but 10 orders of magnitude faster and look directly at structural degrees of freedom. So you have pulse sequences, sequences of very short pulses. We start out working in the visible, but we found that the infrared is extremely interesting because uh, you know, infrared looks at vibrations and vibrations are the mechanical degrees of freedom of any kind of molecule or molecular system. So they're very useful in trying to understand what's going on in terms of motions and interactions and structures. And uh, well, I won't go through it again, but we've looked at a lot of different systems. Uh, we've been very interested in water and in particular water in nano-confined systems which show up all over biology and all over technology, for example, in fuel cell membrane or at the surface of biological membranes. Again, we've also been very interested in things like proton transfer in water, very concentrated ionic solutions, room temperature ionic liquids, but thin films of them in the bulk in membranes, glasses supercooled liquids, and we've been recently doing a lot of work on polymers. And the polymer work is very, very new. And we have a, some very interesting new approaches. And we have all sorts of ideas and analytical models for analyzing the data. And now we want to know whether they really make sense. And that's where the simulations will come in. So uh, I, what I need to do is first just sort of uh, uh, with 
without worrying about you guys worrying about the details too much, show you what we're measuring, what we think it means, and then go into where we think the simulations are helping us and really can help us. So first, uh, this is what uh, this a laser system uh, looks like. I'm going to show you a little more. For making these measurements, we make ultra-fast infrared pulses, and then we make sequences of these pulses. So this stuff over here, this is the laser equipment. All the action is inside of these boxes, which from the camera angle look small, they're as big as this stuff. And the reason why they're in these boxes is we're doing infrared spectroscopy. You want to get rid of uh, the atmospheric water and CO2, which you know absorbs infrared. So stuff has to be boxed up so you can't really see it. So my students were kind enough to open up part of one of the boxes just so you can see what this mess looks like. There's a lot of optics and this is only part of it. There's more over there. There's more off uh, the left side and the right side of what you can see here. And all of this is directed at the sample, which is right there. And the reason why I want you to see this is because I'm going to show you a schematic of the experiment I'm going to talk about. And the schematic is, looks like this is a trivially simple experiment. It's actually, to do it right, it involves a lot of laser production of very short, very uh, tunable, stable infrared pulses, and then all of this stuff to manipulate the pulses and to do the experiment. Okay, so. What we have is, a, as it says here, a fundamentally new approach to the study of polymers. And one of the things uh, that's really exciting is we have a new method for looking at one of the things that's very important in polymers, which are called free volume elements. Um, so uh, this is where being on Zoom isn't so good because I normally want to wave my hands at this point. You know, when you have any kind of liquid uh, you know, molecules don't fill space 100%. You, you know, you take water or anything else, you're going to have some space between uh, some free volume, some uh, gaps where you don't have complete packing. Even this is true even in crystals, of course. But polymers are a different story. Because they're very long chains, they don't pack well. And so you get actually significant voids and when I say significant, you'll see the sizes, you know, the radii can be uh, two, three angstroms, which is, you know, big when you think about the size of atoms and so forth. And um, these free volume elements play a very important role in lots of different kinds of polymer processes. I mean, they really control the nature of a lot of things that go, in, go on in polymers. And like it says here, uh, transport properties, uh, self-diffusion, uh, you know, uh, when you have uh, gas molecules moving through polymers, which are used for separation and filtration, these free volume elements play a very important role. Of course, this is a cartoon. Polymers aren't really little balls, but, you know, this is uh, as good as I can draw. As polymers age, they change their properties. And a lot of that has to do with contraction around these free volume elements. Uh, when you squish a polymer, stretch a polymer, these free volume elements are fundamental in what goes on because you've already got voids and they, they allow chains to move into the voids. They're involved in electrical properties. Polymers are used, they're so important as dielectrics and all sorts of electronics. And these properties uh, where they're essentially voids are really highly involved in like moving electrons through polymers. So the point is that these so-called free volume elements, the fact that polymers being long chains and uh, you, of course, they can uh, move and rearrange, but they can't pack really, really well because, you know, it's, it's like sort of pickup sticks or something like this, where you take a bunch of, you know, uh, sticks and you put them randomly, they're not going to pack perfectly. Okay. So it's very difficult to learn something about these things. And so this is what I was going to show you. All of that optics I was showing you, which you only saw part of it devolves into this very simple diagram of the experiment I'm going to tell you about. This is a, called a pump probe experiment. And what it is, is it's a transient absorption. So what we do is take a polymer. So this is polymethyl methacolate. You know, that's plexiglass. It's a very, very common polymer. And, you know, here's some uh, 
uh, from a simulation. And this is a probe molecule. So what we do is we take this small molecule because we need something we can look at. We're doing vibrational spectroscopy. So this group, the CN stretch, this is, uh, you know, uh, a CN has a very nice vibrational uh, uh, mode that we can tune our lasers into that particular frequency and we can look at it. We use this molecule, which is something that my uh, group has developed a bunch of these things. They're very important. Vibrations typically when you excite them. So what this experiment I'm gonna tell you in a second is you put in a pulse and you put the thing in a vibrational excited state. Uh, remember, you can think of a vibration, uh, you know, classically, you know, you think of this kind of vibration, of course, quantum mechanically, you have vibrational energy levels. So you take things out of the ground vibrational energy level, and you put in the first excited vibrational energy level. The thing is, most vibrations have uh, lifetimes. In other words, they go back to the ground state, which ends the experiment in, in a few picoseconds. We want to look at polymers. Polymers are really, really slow. So what we wanted was a vibrational probes with very long lifetimes. So this is 420 picoseconds. So when we excite this mode, it doesn't lose its energy for a very long time. This allows us to look from hundreds of femtoseconds out to at least a nanosecond. And as you'll see, the ability to look over this law, what in this business is considered a very long time range, it's almost three, four orders of magnitude, all still pretty fast. Okay, so what the experiment is, what we want to do is we want to look at this probe molecule undergo orientational relaxation. So in this polymer, even though the polymer is a solid, it's below the glass transition usually, you put in this probe and it sits in this free, these free volume elements. And so it's not completely in some sense encased in polymer. And what we want to do is use it to probe what the polymer is doing. So what we do is to measure how it undergoes orientational motions, how the uh, probe molecule can wiggle around angularly. We do this pulse sequence. Uh, this is sort of the simplest pulse sequence we do. We bring in a pump molecule, a uh, pump pro pulse, excuse me, which puts the CN stretch in its excited state. And when you put, put this thing in the excited state, uh, that causes the absorption to be reduced because you know, you've taken absorbing molecules and you now they're no longer in the ground state. And now you bring in a probe sometime later and this probe uh, will pass through the sample in the same place and it will, uh, right after T equals zero, which is when you brought this pulse in, the absorption will be reduced, but the absorption also depends on the relative angle between these guys. Because molecules, when this thing is sitting in the sample, this CN stretch is pointing any one molecule in a certain direction. If it's pointing in the same direction as the E field of the pump, it tends to be excited more than if it's pointing perpendicularly. As it rotates, that's going to change. So you bring this probe in, and you bring it in later and later in time, but you look at two different polarizations. You do an experiment where you have, you resolve with this polarizer, you look parallel or perpendicular. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna look at the probe and we're gonna see what happens when the electric field of the probe is either parallel or perpendicular to the pump. And you'll see that's gonna give you orientational relaxation. So the thing that's important is if you measure this intensity of the signal when the probe electric field is parallel to the pump electric field, you get this equation. And when you do it perpendicularly, you see this is plus 0 0.8, which you can derive. This is minus 0 0.4. The key thing is this thing C2 of T. This is the orientational correlation function. This is the sort of the theoretical thing or the experimental thing that tells you how the probe molecule is rotating. And if you form this combination, you look at parallel plus 2i perpendicular, all the orientational stuff goes away and you get the lifetime. That's how we know this thing has a lifetime of 420 picoseconds. 
The important thing is if you measure these two things, and that's the tricky part to do them reproducibly accurately and so forth. If you make this thing, oh, this two shouldn't be here. If you look at parallel minus perpendicular uh, divided by parallel plus two perpendicular, there's no two here, it's a mistake. You get this thing, the lifetime part goes away and this thing, this measurement, this is called the anisotropy, tells you how the molecule rotates. Okay, so that's what we wanna do. And this is what it looks like. Okay, so this is data. Okay, so we did that experiment. We formed that parallel minus perpendicular divided by parallel plus two perpendicular. And so this is giving you the nature of the rotation of this probe molecule when it's embedded in this polymer. And uh, what you can see here, first, it should start at point four, but this is ultra fast, which is called inertial motion, which we, which we don't have the resolution and there's other reasons why you can't measure it. This difference tells us about that. But then you see there's a fast decay that's about eight picoseconds, and then it turns into a much slower decay, which is about 265 picoseconds, and then it levels off. If you were looking at this in a liquid, the molecule would completely randomize its direction. There'd be nothing to prevent it. The thing about what goes on here is you're in this polymer and these polymer chains are not moving fast. That's for sure. You know, you take a piece of polymer, it just sits there, it's a solid. And so this thing will not be able to randomize. It's gonna be able to wiggle around. It's gonna be able to sample a bunch of angles but it's not going to randomize its direction. And that's sort of the key here. So this is referred to as wobbling in a cone. So the idea is that this first part, it samples very, very rapidly some limited range of angles. And then on this longer time scale of eight picoseconds, it samples more angles. These two things actually combine and occur fast compared to any polymer motions. So now, if nothing else happened, this thing would just sort of go horizontal right there. But the polymer has side chains, even though the, the, the whole polymer chain structure, the, the large polymer units, these things are gonna move on, you know, seconds, hours, years types of time scales. But small segments, uh, monomers of the polymer, you know, little chain segments and the side groups in the polymer, those things can move on faster time scales. And as they sort of move, like take this group right here, if it sort of moves out of the way, then this probe can sample some space that was blocked before. And so this motion of the polymer side groups and small chain segments gives you this guy. And that gives you another cone. So basically without the polymer moving, you're going to get a certain range of angles that this probe can sample. And then on a longer time scale, after pieces of the polymer move, move out of the way, this probe can sample a larger range of angles. Okay, and that's sort of the key here. Before I tell you how we use this to get information, we found something that's really unusual that you don't see in liquids. We found that, so that CN stretch, that's this mode, CN is stretching. You take an absorption spectrum and you know there's different frequencies. When we do the experiment at different wavelengths, we see different dynamics. This is the same type of data I was just showing you. But if you look at this wavelength, you see this decay curve is quite different than if I look at this wavelength or if I look further to the red. So as you go from high frequency, the blue side of the line, to low frequency, the red side of the line, you see the dynamics are different. The dynamics are slower as you move further and further red. Okay, and what we find is when we look at that angular sampling, how much that probe can, can't completely randomize, but it can sample this within this cone of angles, when we look at that, what we find is this, this is the total cone. We actually see the same thing for the individual pieces, that what you see is that the range of angles that could be sampled by the probe 
depends on the wavelength in this spectroscopic line. And as you see, this is a key thing. Okay, so then we developed this very, very simple model, and I'm not gonna have time to go into how we tested it. We can vet it through some other experiments. We actually think we learn a lot more. And basically, so here's the center of mass, and think of that CN as a vector, that bond, and it's wiggling around, so that's supposed to be it's wiggling around. You see it's sampling this cone of angles. Okay, well, just imagine this thing is embedded in this free volume element, which we model as a cylinder. So if you look at the range of angles that can be sampled, well, that range of angles gives you the radius of the cylinder. So you can deter, turn the time-dependent angular sampling we can measure directly, and we know exactly what we're measuring. There, this is solid. And then we have this model which says, okay, if I can sample this cone of angles and no more, that's because I'm hitting the walls of the free volume element, and that gives me the radius. Okay, but what this shows is that the radius, there isn't one radius because there's all sorts of free volume elements. They're different sizes. They have different radii, but we can actually look selectively at these different free volume elements, sub ensembles that have different sizes by just picking out different wavelengths. And this is what we get. Now, remember I showed you there was these fast motions that I said occurred before the polymer had a chance to move. That's this black, black points. A longer time, I'm going to come back to what this is, you get this second thing, the, the slower motion. It gives you another thing. So this is actually angstroms. Uh, I'll, I'll show you some numbers. But what you can see is we can actually move through this thing, select out sub-ensembles of free volume elements, and tell you how big they are, and this is one of the big deals, and get the probability of getting a free volume element of a certain size. So notice the size scale here. Here's two angstroms, here's three angstroms. I mean, we have you know fraction of an angstrom ability to measure how big these voids are that are central to polymer properties. Uh, we can measure these things, and of course it changes from one polymer to the other, changes with temperature. And so this is a big deal. So we go from making this ultra-fast dynamical measurement and what we end up with is measuring on a sub-angstrom distance scale, I mean, uh, resolution, how big these free volume elements are. Now, okay, if those are how big they are, what's this? Okay, so here's the idea. By the way, I'm, I'm gonna come back to this, but naively, initially, we thought we would just say, okay, the probability of having a particular size, so here again, here's a couple angstroms, here's three angstroms, three and a half angstroms, just track the spectrum. That's good enough for right now, I'll come back to this. But what you see is that longer time scale uh, uh, motions showed larger. So here's, you know, this is the second thing and the sizes are bigger. But we did some experiments that showed it actually wasn't this is my cartoon of a free volume element, right? And these are little pieces of the polymer around the outside. That you weren't actually, the free volume elements weren't getting bigger on a nanosecond time scale. Here's what was happening. What's happening is that the surface of this free volume element fluctuates. These polymers on this hundreds of picosecond time scale have small chain segment motions, have side group motions. And what that does is, so, this is the same thing, but the idea is some of the so some of the surface, like here I'm showing, it sort of moves this way, and part of the range that was accessible is gone, but new area, new volume opens up because some of this stuff moved that way, and so you haven't changed on the ensemble average the size of the free volume element, but you've changed the accessible volume which leads to bigger angular sampling. I couldn't sample these, the probe couldn't move here at short time, so it couldn't sample those angles, but at longer time, it can sample those angles. It's already sampled these angles, even though they're blocked off. And so what this second thing is telling you is how 
the shape, it, the time scale are shape fluctuations, and it gives you a measure not of the a change in size, but the change in all of the volume that is sampled through fluctuations. So this is something that no other technique has gotten to. There's no time resolution. There are some techniques that can do can measure some properties time independent of free volume elements, but nothing like this. Okay. We can also get electric with this thing because uh, the CN stretch of is a nitrile. Its frequency is this what's called the Stark effect. And the Stark effect is when you apply electric field, you shift the vibrational frequency. And this has been studied to death. CNs are really important in biology. You put them in as labels actually to measure electric fields in, in proteins. And a lot of what we know about electric fields and proteins comes from stark spectroscopy on like CN probes put into uh, uh, actually uh, uh, as used artificial amino acids that have CNs hanging off of them and you can study uh, electric fields and proteins. Okay, so there's a large stark coupling. That's stark coupling, a name that the guy just says. You put a bigger electric field, this thing shifts its frequency to low frequency to the red. And you can calibrate that by taking this probe and you put it in 10 different solvents that people know things about it. There's this Anzager method for figuring this out. So you can determine the star coupling constant. And what that means is from the frequency shift, you can get the electric field. So here's the type of thing we end up with. We can say, okay, I've got this, uh, sub-ensemble of free volume elements that are 2.44 angstroms in volume. There's an error bar on that, of course. And that corresponds to a certain frequency in this line. And that frequency gives you the electric field felt inside that free volume element. And the electric field is correlated with the frequency, which is a really good handle into simulating this stuff, as you're going to see in a second. because. From a simulation, from a classical MD simulation, it's relatively straightforward to calculate from the simulation electric fields. It's not easy to calculate quantum energy levels. So this is this is a really good thing. Okay, uh, okay. So I've told you a bunch of things, and we have models, and we think we know what this meant, but there's. We want to really vet our understanding and pull out details that we can't get directly from the experiments. So there's two important things. We need to be able to confirm a lot of these things I'm saying, and uh, we, need, we want to be able to understand things that are implied by the experiment that you can't measure experimentally. Okay, so I don't have to really say this, so uh, we're, collaborating with Chung Lin, and uh, here's something he just gave me, because simulating polymers, I'll show you, we're not quite able to do what we want to do, but we've come up with a scheme uh, that we think will give us all the desired information. So the equilibration is the big stumbling block. You really cannot simulate a long chain polymer, you know, a standard polymer that as I was showing you, the thing I was showing at 350,000 molecular weight, and it's a glass, the time scale from motions uh, in a real material, you know, uh, literally for the change to move and, uh, and change their structure, you know, you're talking seconds, hours, years, nobody knows. They're glasses, right? It goes on for hundreds of years, millions of years. This isn't something you can readily simulate. So, but I'll, I'll tell you what we came up with. But to do it, we starting with oligomers, things that are shorter. Uh, and this is what uh, Chung Wen has been working on. So as he says, he starts out with a simulation box. You take it up to high temperature to get things to move faster. You can do some simulation to cool down to the desired temperature. Then you do this, is this equilibration. This is a real problem. And you'll hear people saying they simulate polymers and they they pretend that they could actually equilibrate a real polymer. It's, it's just, it's impossible. 
Okay, and then after, as you'll see, the equilibration, then there's the, you know, perform the MD simulation, desired temperature, uh, using standard things that people use for polymers, as I'll show you, didn't work. And so this is why you need data to first vet the simulations and then use the simulations to be able to pull out molecular level things that you can't measure. And to vet the simulations was to calculate this thing, which we can measure because this orientational relaxation. So when this was done, it doesn't say it here. Uh, uh, Chen Wen put in the probe. So it was the polymer. The first one was PMMA with this probe molecule and this was put together and then he can simulate and calculate this uh, second Legendre polynomial correlation function, basically the angular motions of the probe. Okay, so I just want to show you, uh, so we start with polymethyl methacrylate, PMMA, and this probe, our phenylcyanate, and when he took just, you know, I, I think I have this right, standard potentials that people would use for simulating polymers because they had no way to know they weren't wrong. Here we have two things. We have uh, a thousand molecular weight, what we call the tenmer. It's 10 monomers in green. And then we have the high molecular weight polymer, 350,000. And when you use just sort of standard, what people would get out of standard potential sets, it like didn't work at all. First of all, the low molecular weight and the high molecular weight came out the same and they don't look anything like the data. So then uh, Chen Wen went in and messed with it. And this is where the experiments come in. So he had a target. He knew, and it turned out to be, I only know this because he tells me, he explains these things to more, more uh, to me. Uh, he changed the Leonard Jones potential, mainly the depth of the well. And you see, this is now really amazingly, I mean, better than I see simulations of liquids of reproducing our experimental data on the tender. And this is something that he could equilibrate because it's not a long chain. The, and here's what we're getting at, where we're going to, we, we need to do the experiments. Uh, this is his simulation of the 40 mer. This is already getting to be long enough that the glass transition is approaching that of the real high molecular polymer. We, he can, we can do it. We haven't done the experiments yet. Uh, we actually having trouble making this sample, but we're going to make this 10 mer sample. But you can see when you go, I'm sorry, 40 mer. When you go from very short chain to longer chain, you're approaching the really high molecular weight. And the game plan is we think that this thing, which has 40 monomers, this is a long enough chain to really give us the properties of polymers. Even the short chains are going to give us a lot. So while you can't simulate the actual high molecular weight, you can simulate something that's close enough to the high molecular weight, we believe, and we're going to be able to test these things experimentally back and forth to simulations. And right now I got people working it seems crazy. We can make this really low molecular weight sample. We can make a really high molecular weight sample. We're having a lot of trouble getting the quality of sample we need to do this experiment, but we're on it. We hope to be able to have this soon and we'll see. Okay, so, so here's some of the things. So coming out of the simulation, once it's vetted, in other words, once uh, Chen Wen showed he could reproduce our data, then he can start calculating uh, what, for example, this is this probability versus radius uh, of the free volume elements. Now you notice, if you remember, it went by fast. I sort of showed you this thing as a Gaussian. Uh, and we, when we first saw the simulation, we went, oh, it doesn't work very well. It's not Gaussian. I'm going to show you this is right and we were wrong initially. <laughs> uh, doesn't look very Gaussian. He can also calculate electric fields, which is about to become really important with what we want to understand. Okay, so this is PMA. Just quickly, our understanding changed when we said, okay, now we'll do polystyrene, another really complicated, uh, really common and complicated polymer. And we put the same probe in. And this is where 
our simple pictures started to fall apart because this is the radius as a function of these wavelengths. And when we did the same thing over here, you see it works on the blue side, the high frequency side of the line, and then it stops changing. And this is real, we repeat it. We didn't believe it at first, we repeated it many times, and this is correct. And you notice while this spectrum is almost Gaussian, this thing has this tail over here at uh, low frequency, and that's tied into this. So we looked at this and we really didn't understand what was going on, and I don't have time to talk about it, but we realized we were making a very simple assumption, which turned out not to be correct. We were assuming you could basically treat these, this, this correlation between the free volume element size and the frequency sort of as really skinny. One free volume element size gives you one frequency. But of course, there's a distribution. One free volume element size gives you there's a range. And when it looks like this in PMMA, there's a narrow range. And starting here, there's a narrow range. But then what you find out is you start to get lots, the same free volume element size can give you lots of frequencies. I don't have time to go into it. Now we have a complicated theory of how these things correlate. This is sort of as a test of the theory. And what we found was we can pull out these distributions. They're not Gaussian and they're different for different polymers. And I just want to show you, notice now when we think we have a better theory based on a more detailed understanding of how to correlate the spectroscopy and, and get the sizes relative to these frequencies and how you turn that into the distribution. Now for PMMA, we no longer get a Gaussian. It has a shape that uh, uh, Chung Wen was telling us this was the type of shape this thing should have to the begin with. So we can pull this out and we'll be able to compare this. Okay, so now working on polystyrene, we looking at one of these small guys, the five mer, we did a temperature dependence. And this is just really remarkable. Again, the standard potential set that people would have used for polystyrene didn't work. Uh, Chung Wen tweaked it to get agreement at one temperature. By the way, we have about 10 temperatures. I'm only showing you four that he simulated and we measured. And this is really remarkable agreement between the simulation and the data and getting the temperature dependence. There's no adjustable parameters. I mean, once you uh, get the potential to be right for one, then you calculate the temperature dependence. And you can see this is very low temperature. It's close to glass transition. And then as you go up as temperature, of course, things get much, much faster. And uh, so this shows really good agreement with polystyrene. We're going to be able to understand the temperature dependence and how we can relate that. What this looks like, what, what I was showing you before for polystyrene, you see when you're at a uh, high frequency, when you take a small step in frequency, you get a big change in dynamics. That means a big, a significant change in the free volume element, the size of this free volume element. But as you go to the red, it all bunches up and you change the frequency and there's essentially no change in this thing, uh, in, in the size. The size correlates with many different frequencies. So, uh, so, here are the things we, so this is our picture of this. So we want to see, we say that the size is correlated with the electric field. This is something that can come out of simulations. Uh, Chung Wen can go in and start picking out subsets that have the same free volume element size and look at the electric field and see if there's this correlation. And is the correlation strong for large radii in polystyrene, but weak for small radii? This is really interesting because what it says is that the larger, on the blue side of the line, you get the larger guys. And what it's saying is for large free volume elements, there's actually a relatively narrow range of structural configurations of the polymer that can give you this large void. But as the void gets smaller, there are more and more structural configurations which give you more and more different electric fields, which give you more and more different frequencies. 
you can see here, as you step the frequency down, initially there's a significant change, but then when you get to low frequencies, the same free volume element size correlates with a bunch of frequencies, which correlates to a bunch of different electric fields. So this is really interesting. What, are, what we're thinking, which we hope we can see is right or wrong from the simulations, is that the larger free volume elements, there's only a limited number of polymer structures that can give you a large void. And the limited number of structures means the limited number of chemical configurations, which means there's a narrow range of electric fields, which gives rise to a narrow range of frequencies. But as the void, this free volume element gets small, there are more and more polymer configurations that can give you the same size void that manifests as a, a wide range of electric fields associated with one size, which means a wide range of frequencies. So these are really interesting questions about the nature of polymer structure. Of course, there's also the dynamics. I mean, dynamics, electric fields, all of this stuff comes out of this stuff. So we've just actually, it's been, well, it would have, we would have had a year of doing these experiments if the uh, virus hadn't interfered. We were closed down for three or four months. And uh, we've been working with Chung Wen for only, I don't know, six, eight. Well, it depends how you, what you do about the virus in the middle. But on both ends, we're making a lot of progress. And the combination of these simulations and looking at different polymers, looking at different molecular weights, looking at these correlations between size and electric fields, this is going to teach us a tremendous amount about, uh, about polymers and how they function as materials uh, for those things I showed you in the beginning, things like uh, uh, gas and liquid permeability through polymers. All sorts of different properties depend on the distribution, the size, the time-dependent structural fluctuations of these free volume elements. As I said, we have lots of models, we have ideas, but to get the details, we want to make sure we're thinking right, and we want to pull out all sorts of details that we can't get out of the experiments, but you can get out of simulations. The simulations, we believe, when they can reproduce the experimental data, which uh, is going very, very well. So anyway, uh, I know this is probably a lot of stuff that those of you who are sort of not in molecular business or spectroscopists, but basically the idea is we can use ultrafast spectroscopy to get a lot of interesting properties about polymers, dynamics, structure, but to vet these things, to really understand and to pull out molecular level details that we can't get from the experiment, what we need or we need simulations. The simulations feed off of the experiments in the sense that to get the simulations to work properly, you muck with them until they can reproduce the data, then you can believe the results, and then we can use those simulations to confirm some of our ideas and then give us lots of details that we can't get without the simulations. Okay, so uh, I hope they gave you some idea of ultra-fast spectroscopy, looking at very fine details of structure and dynamics in polymers. So I'm gonna stop sharing, there we go. Okay. <laughs> If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, so let's thank um, Professor Michael Fayer. Oh, thank, thank you me. very much. Wonderful talk. Wonderful yeah. talk. Thank you. So if you have any questions, I suggest you can email um, Chang Wen with them later on as we're running out of time. Yeah. I want to. Or you can email me. <laughs> and, yes. right, and, and Professor Fayer as well. Thank you. And I just want to thank you all for attending our first seminar. Throughout the seminar series, we'll be featuring individual core facilities and relevant technologies. The next seminar is scheduled for August 11th. It's to be announced. So save the date. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you for attending. <laughs>